Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello. Good day. Um, welcome to this sixth briefing for members of Parliament. This one is on rising military budgets and the UN mechanism to curb them. Is it mission impossible? As some of you know, global military expenditures are at an all-time high, nearly two trillion US dollars in 2020. Despite exceedingly slow progress toward the SDGs, uh, once in a century pandemic and out of control climate change, important resources continue to be diverted to military budgets that do nothing to meet the urgent needs of the people. At least since 1978, with the final document of the 10th special session of the G General Assembly on Disarmament, the UN has called for a gradual reduction of military budgets on a mutually agreed basis, for example, in absolute figures or in terms of percentage points that would contribute to the curbing of the arms race and would increase the possibilities of reallocation of resources now being used for military purposes to economic and social development, particularly for the benefit of developing countries. In 1980, the GA had a resolution further, that further called for international agreements to freeze, reduce, or otherwise restrain military expenditures. Further to several such pronouncements over the years, the UN instituted a mechanism to track national military expenditures with the aim of raising public awareness, incentivizing transparency, and building trust amongst nations. Key to this mechanism was a reporting system in which each government is invited to report annually and publicly to the UN on its military expenditures. While the reporting system has helped generate awareness of the issue, generally it has not delivered on its other objectives of transparency and trust. And that's due to a number of reasons, including the purely voluntary nature of the reporting exercise which in recent years resulted in only 30 to 40 reports out of 193 countries, 30 to 40 reports being filed annually with the UN. Voluntary adherence to the UN reporting guidelines, which results in many reports being incomplete or misleading. And thirdly, the absence of an agreed international definition of what constitutes excessive military spending. With only partial data on global military budgets to go by, the UN must rely on excellent data that the authoritative Stockholm International Peace Research Interest Institute, or CIPRI, and other similar institutions are able to obtain directly by researching national budgets, cross-border military sales, and other such resources. And so the purpose of this briefing is to answer four questions and to give members of parliament a chance to discuss this issue. The first question we posed was, how can the UN reporting mechanism be strengthened to put more pressure on countries to provide complete and accurate information? Given the trend in global military spending so far, will member states of the UN ever agree to participate in a more rigorous reporting mechanism? Thirdly, is reporting alone a sufficient approach to reducing excessive military spending? And fourthly, can the UN help broker any agreement to actually freeze, reduce, or otherwise restrain military expenditures as called for in the 1980 resolution? And so we have three terrific experts uh, to join us today and, and provide their comments and, and uh, that we can ask questions too. Firstly, we have His Excellency Am Ambassador Rodrigo Carroza, the permanent representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations. And of course, Costa Rica is leading by example. We will have uh, Izumi Nakamitsu, who's the Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs at the United Nations. And thirdly, from CIPRI, the chair of the uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, the fabulous Ambassador Jan Eliasson, former president of the General Assembly, uh, UN General Assembly, and of course, a former um, uh, Deputy Secretary General. Welcome to all of you. And I think we'll turn now to you, Ambassador Carroza, and ask you um, to uh, provide your comments uh, on this topic and uh, some guidance for members of parliament, hopefully, particularly. Welcome. Thank you uh, very much. and. Uh... 
very glad and uh, very honored to uh, be with uh, you in this uh, conversation and with uh, such an Excel uh, company of experts. I am not an expert on the, this field, uh, just a long way, way a long mileage uh, achieved and a stint both at the UN in the last uh, three years and a half and at the parliament in Costa Rica also for a one single period as uh, we have in in our country but uh, nevertheless uh, and with the support of uh, my staff i i can say a few words and reflect on what parliament parliamentarians and parliaments can do in regards uh, to this issue costa rica leads by example yes but it has not uh, filed the report for the last year, yes, that's the expression that I made when I found out uh, about uh, this. And then uh, let me see if uh, during the day that can be done because the report is very simple, nil. No military expenditures uh, in uh, Costa Rica, uh, unfortunately. And why don't we report that? And, 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 uh, and they set some, uh, some a guide or some uh, I don't I don't want to use the word example but uh, it set the the fact that yes a peace can be achieved without armaments uh, we don't need a armament in Costa Rica or anywhere would would we uh, say uh, since uh, security does not request the militarization, increasing budgets uh, to cope with, uh, the, with those needs, nor a modernization of the abundant uh, equipment that, that there is uh, for a war. Uh, security is something else. Security is uh, freedom from, from fear, freedom from uh, uh, indignity, freedom from want, and that is what uh, we, we believe is uh, tending to the well-being of all. The main uh, task, fundamentally, of all the governments in the world, they are set up by people in order, in order for them to care for their well-being by apportioning limited uh, resources which uh, exist in uh, the world. And then we states come together in multilateral institutions created in order that the, to see how these uh, limited uh, resources by, by definition can be used for social and economic development of people. Again, not of uh, entities or territories, of uh, people. We, we, we very much tend to recite Article 26 of the Charter. And uh, in preparing for this conversation, we went back to the origins of uh, Article uh, 26 and found out how uh, the Charter states that the Security Council is responsible for the formulation of plans with the purpose of not diverting it's limited resources from the social and economic orientations and that it is upon the members after the Security Council acts on them to define ways of precisely limiting that diversion. But then I find that it is even written that Article 26 is that letter that uh, has uh, been put into a complete oblivion. There's uh, no, no tendency to find particular plans that may lead countries and all countries to use uh, those uh, limited uh, resources uh, for th those purposes. Of course, uh, the, re the reporting uh, mechanism that dates uh, from 1980, as has uh, been said, uh, yes, it has uh, done its uh, purpose, uh, and we are gathered today to see if we can uh, 
shed some light in its strengthening and in its uh, fulfilling uh, the purpose. Of course, uh, uh, more expert voices will help uh, say how this can be strengthened and, and where, whereas uh, it is sufficient. I believe that uh, the reporting done by 40 countries uh, in the last year, one of them is a report of four uh, lines saying the total is expenditure, uh, one of the biggest expend, uh, biggest uh, uh, the countries with the biggest uh, figures in military expenditure says our total expenditure has been of uh, XX amount or billions of uh, XX uh, uh, currency. Uh, that is the report. Does that build trust? Does that build uh, understanding? Is that a good lead? Well, at least this is a figure that, that, that of course, has been over time analyzed by CIPRI and uh, put into, into perspective, uh, perhaps saying much, much more than what the report says. Uh, so, so Ambassador, thank you for that. And let me, uh, let's uh, put you on hold for a sec and let's turn to Azumi and come back to you. Um, because certainly you have already identified something that the members of parliament on here can do. They can check if their own country has filed such a report as you, as you found out that your country had suddenly not um, and ask for that. And then uh, we'll have an opportunity for members of parliament to ask each of our experts questions, and they can do that by posing the question in the chat or by uh, putting their hand up, their electronic hand, um, and we will uh, have a chance to uh, have questions and, and to have more feedback from our experts. I'll turn now to Azumi Nakamitsu. Of course, uh, she is the Under Secretary General and High Representative on Disarmament Affairs, and we're very happy in your east-facing sunshine to have you join us <laughs> today. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Natsumitsu. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would just make a very brief uh, general introductory remarks, and I, I really do um, look forward to these um, uh, four questions and interactive uh, discussions on this. Um, I mean, the, the general uh, situation as we see in the world is that the world remains overarmed and uh, social and economic programs really continued to be underfunded. And I think it, it became so apparent, uh, obviously, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and now we are slowly coming out of the pandemic. Um, we need to focus on um, recovery from, from the pandemic. Um, but, um, you know, the, the statistics really show that uh, in 2020, last year, the, the GDP, the global GDP really shrunk. Uh, due to the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's interesting, some countries, because of the, the pandemic, um, they um, reallocated some of their planned military spending to a pandemic response. Um, the examples are, you know, Chile and uh, Republic of Korea, and several others, including, interestingly, Brazil and, and the Russian Federation, uh, also spent considerably less than their military budgets that have been uh, foreseen. Um, so, um, so there are a few examples like that, uh, but the fact of the matter is, as you started, the total military, um, global military expenditure last year rose to almost 2 trillion US dollars, 1.98 trillion to be a little bit more accurate. Um, and the, the share of the global GDP rose by 0.2%, to 2.4%, um, um, to and, and this obviously from, uh, from CIPRI statistics. Um, another stark example, um, combined government and private sector investments in nuclear weapons um, in nine of those countries that have nuclear arms rose by uh, $1.4 billion uh, to a total of $72.2 six billion dollars and this is a statistic um, uh, put together by ICANN and that's clearly not a small amount of money. Um, so what we you know are really um, um, feeling here at the UN is that military solutions only approach to security problems um, 
really come at the expense of first and foremost development and socioeconomic uh, uh, programs um, and um, as a result uh, at, the, at the expense of human security uh, and di direct um, resources you know take uh, um, uh, resources away uh, from the achievements of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, I remind all of us that we are in the decade of action um, and, and we are very much behind, um, again, because of the uh, COVID uh, in terms of really achieving the SDGs. So obviously, um, you know, this is a huge issue. Now, another important factor, this is particularly felt strongly in conflict-affected countries. Uh, data shows that spending on defense as a share of GDP um, outspaces spending clearly on the health sector uh, by uh, two to three times in conflict affected countries and in the opposite being true in more stable uh, countries. So one of the conclusions, obviously, parliaments have a huge role to play in reducing military expenditure through oversight, for example, uh, budget and policy making and, and also mobilization. Um, that uh, parliaments can play. Um, uh, of course, civil society organization has a huge role to play also. Um, and, um, and, you know, all these things actually are important advocates uh, for national budgeting. And, and you know, we want to, um, to focus um, on social investment much more, especially today, um, and less on military spending. So thank you again. Um, we were very, very grateful for this uh, event um, because we are now starting much more seriously to uh, reflect and review uh, on the military expenditure issue. Um, and that featured, I, I hope you also noticed, that featured strongly in the Secretary General's uh, common agenda as well. So back to you. Looking forward to the conversation. Of course, you also referred to uh, uh, the Secretary General's new Our Common Agenda, which is a document people can get online, or if they're members of Parliament, they can certainly ask us for, um, where he lays out a plan for the future. And um, uh, it's an important opportunity, again, for members of Parliament to appreciate the goals of the, of the UN. Um, we'll now turn to the former Deputy Secretary General um, uh, and the former President of the uh, General Assembly, but now the chair of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, who I mentioned in the opening, is some, uh, an organization that is tracking these expenditures and shedding light. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, this is to be an IPU day. I just come from the Swedish parliament where we discussed uh, how to make peace agreements more lasting to work with prevention and also post-conflict work. Uh, this is one of the many good things that IPU is working with now, and I think you have an important role in, in many areas, including this one that we have discussed. Uh, I was very glad to hear both the ambassador and Izumi to quote Cipri. Uh, I'm glad that our research is uh, being used. Facts kick, as one say, and the foundation of wisdom is facts. And we try to come out with evidence-based facts on important issues, and we have done so since the mid-60s. Uh, let me just give you these, uh, fix, these facts. Uh, last year, we had a spending, a military expenditure of 1,981 billion dollars, almost two trillion, as some of you said. This is two, 2.4% of global GDP. It reflects also $254 per person in the world on military expenditure. And uh, unfortunately, this uh, increased over the last year to 2.6 year. Uh, since this, so it was an increase of two, by 2.6% by in the 220. In order to make the, the bridge and connect to what uh, Izumi and the, the ambassador mentioned, uh, I can tell you what this means in terms of alternative use of money. Uh, there is a uh, study by the Overseas Development Institute estimating 
that about 430 million people will be living in extreme poverty by 2030. Uh, while most countries can afford to invest in human uh, development, like education, health, nutrition, social protection, 46% of the poorest countries cannot afford such investment and face a funding gap of roughly 200 billion per year. Now, let's just take divert 10%, 10% of the global military spending in 2020, and what would it achieve on goal number one of SDG? It would almost completely cover the funding shortfall for the 46 poorest countries in the world. So I think this is just to put figures on a, a, a huge political challenge that I think we have to face up to. It's not only the size of the military expenditures and the underfunding of uh, development. Uh, it is also the fact that, as Izumi knows, uh, this uh, military expenditure also means rising risks. They, uh, it, is the, it includes uh, nuclear uh, developments, uh, new category of weapons, and you sometimes see even the, uh, the dimming of the, the uh, border between conventional and nuclear weapons. And with the mistrust in the world today, uh, this huge figure, unbelievable figure, is also a risk element. And it should be in the enlightened self-interest of the world to adopt a definition of security in a broader context than we have ha in the past. I think we were distorted in our thinking during the Cold War and with the tremendous uh, focus on, on, on military uh, aspects of security. When I was president of the General Assembly, Kofi Annan and I were very proud to present the formula, there is no peace without development but there is no development without peace. And no peace and no development without respect of human rights. In other words, we have to strengthen these three pillars at the same time. And today it's hard to do so with the division of resources uh, as we have today, the distribution of resources as we have today. That's why I, I really like your edition from our field to come up with this question. And I think we should, we should say, we should look into the reporting, but the reporting as a basis for action, as always, facts kick, uh, and strengthen the UN mechanism. And I'm sure that if we particularly use the argument of enlightened self-interest, we could get member states to accept to have a stronger mechanism. In the meantime, of course, CIPRI is always prepared to be there with our uh, hopefully trusted uh, figures and so forth. But I think it would be better to have it on the international level because then we would also strengthen multilateralism, which, a which is a major challenge today. So I, I would hope that some courageous member states, and they don't have to be that courageous, should uh, take up your question and try to see whether the UN could broker an agreement to freeze, reduce, or otherwise restrain military expenditure. And I just picked up, uh, lastly, the UN Charter. I have the UN Charter at my table always. It's well. always in your pocket. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and you know, the, the Security Council is responsible for formulating plans to be submitted to the members of the UN for the establishment of a system for the regulation of armaments. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a binding resolution, isn't it? And it's the UN Charter. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I think that the, this initiative of yours is great. I think IPU should stand tall and come up with this. Uh, you represent, after all, the first three words of the charter, don't you? We the people. <laughs> and speak out on this, because I, I think most people, if you go out on the street and look at these, these relationship between spending on military expenditure as to the saving people from extreme poverty in 46 nations by only a tenth of that. That's pretty obvious what, where we would have world public opinion. So uh, thank you for inviting us to this discussion. Great to be in this company.
Thank you. And thank you for agreeing to stay to answer some questions because you've certainly given us um, some food for thought. And, and uh, it is enlightened self-interest, of course, but uh, it's also about choices. And parliamentarians around the world, as they vote on budgets, do make choices. Um, and so hopefully um, we can have that discussion. I will uh, ask people if they have a question to raise their hand. Um, you can do that through the electronic means, or if you're on screen, you can literally pop up your hand um, and I will try and see you. Um, I know, um, why don't we have one question from Alessandro uh, Motter, who's um, uh, uh, an expert with the IPU um, in New York to ask the first question. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to break the ice this morning. Uh, my question is for the entire panel. Of course, you can um, take it later. Um, uh, you were all familiar with the famous phrase coined by President Eisenhower that refers in his uh, uh, departing speech from the White House, he referred to, uh, he warned against the uh, military industrial complex. Uh, that was a long time ago, but as we know, that complex is alive and well today. Uh, my question is, so what drives these uh, rise in military expenditures, if we think about it logically? You would think there are only two possibilities in my mind. One is precisely that uh, there is an economic interest that countries and politicians and governments um, uh, think is uh, real because uh, military is also jobs. It's also employment. It's, it's GDP. It's, it's good business. It's good exports. Many countries are big exporters of, uh, of um, military um, equipment, as you know, and they make a living. Uh, it, their economy, partly, politicians assume, depends on those investments, on those exports. So that's one possible driver. The other possible driver, as I see it, is rising um, tensions around the world. Uh, to what extent can we argue? Is there an argument to say, some countries are really concerned about their own security, and therefore they are trying to acquire <laughs> the stuff that it takes to defend yourself for potentially. It's not necessarily um, an, an offensive posture that countries, uh, all countries are taking, that you know they want to somehow be ready to attack others. They, they, sometimes you can argue maybe in some places they, it's a self-defensive uh, strategy or dissuasion. So how do you play these two things uh, against each other? Are they maybe concurrent? Or is one, the economic interest, the main driver of these expenditures? Um, and in fact, I would be curious to know, uh, even in the reporting that CIPRI has, uh, or that the UN has, uh, how much of the, um, of, these, uh, 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 of, the, of the money that's, uh, that's um, spent in the military goes into acquiring, into importing, uh, military equipment uh, from others as opposed to uh, producing your own armament in, 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 at home. So those are, that's my question. So it's a bit complicated maybe, but it's about the drivers of this process and the, the, the actual security concerns versus the economic concerns and, and how do you see it? Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Est-ce qu'il y a les autres qui veulent poser une question? Je pense que... Nan, uh, oh, you're from Cypri. Uh, Shomel? Moussa, I see you. John, are you interested in asking a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, let me thank you, first of all, for uh, organizing this meeting and um, I appreciate. Um, one of the questions I have is, uh, is it possible to know which countries have been able to submit their reports or is it um, uh, confidential? Uh, number two, uh, why, what would be the reasons for not actually providing reports? Is it because the report itself is complicated uh, or, or it has information that uh, it would be considered unnecessary. I mean, uh, what would be what in, in your experience from 1990, 1980? What what are the, what are the real reasons, really? Why only 30 to 40 countries are submitting and the others are not? Maybe Thank you, John. With, that, with that background, we might be able to 
uh, be able to make further contribution. Thank you. And can I just ask which which parliament you are from? I'm from Rwanda. Rwanda. Okay. Terrific. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. So some basic information for members of parliament, where to find these reports or how, uh, how, how do they work? Um, and perhaps Azumi knows whether or not Rwanda has filed a report um, and uh, you can look at that. I was hoping to take a third question, but why don't we, uh, why don't we go ahead and answer those? Azumi, perhaps you can answer John and all of you may have, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I'm gonna ask Musa first to, to pose his question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, Tanzania and this uh, important agenda that um, we're discussing about the future of the planet, the future of our, of our youth and, and people. Um, we've been talking a lot about these uh, agendas for several years, but the nuclear gurus are still making arms and the race is going very, very fast. Um, we should uh, walk the talk and now we should come with a solution of how do we stop this by at least explaining to them. The enemy at the moment is not between ourselves. The most enemy we have in the world now is climate. Mm -hmm. We should look at what the climate is doing to this planet now. Our resources should be rooted to defend and to protect the Mother Earth from environmental damages. We've seen the wildfires, we've seen floods in different areas, and this country should be told now that now we put these funds instead of building arms and having competing on arms, now we should care about how we are going to help the world in issues of environment. We, we know uh, in Tanzania, we were very small budget in defense. We uh, root most of our spending on education, social services, and uh, education and the future. And this can also be done in other countries. The problem is policy makers sometimes have been lobbied by major companies to, to, to convince their, company, their country to buy arms. And we should also mind about uh, policy makers who are climate deniers. We have policy makers who are climate deniers. And this is where we are very, very wrong. Now, the silver bullet of what this Earth can be said is to help our people, to help the nation, to help the major countries understand that most of the major spending should be rooted on social services. Terrific. Thanks, Musa. I'm just going to mute you again. And uh, I'll take one last question from, uh, from uh, Laurent Worley from Switzerland, who's a member of the UN uh, Affairs Committee uh, from the IPU. And then I'm definitely going to the to the experts so that we don't forget the questions. Laurent. Merci beaucoup, Paddy. Merci pour l'organisation de, de ce briefing. Merci à nos trois orateurs et, et à chaque collègue et autres personnes présentes. Euh, J'ai été euh, tout à fait intéressé à, à entendre l'un de nos orateurs préciser l'aspect économique aussi de, de la vente des armes. Alors, je suis évidemment... Euh, pleinement d'accord, notamment avec mes préopinants, que nous avons d'autres priorités aujourd'hui que de faire la guerre, et en particulier celle, la problématique du climat est, est un élément sur lequel nous devons absolument intervenir. Mais il me semble, mais peut-être que l'un ou l'autre de nos orateurs pourra, pourra peut-être compléter ma réflexion, que tant que nous n'aurons pas une réflexion globale, on ne peut pas juste dire « arrêtons d'acheter des armes ». Parce que « arrêtons d'acheter des armes » signifie évidemment derrière des enjeux économiques majeurs, des emplois aussi, et pas simplement des aspects d'enrichissement d'entreprises euh, ou de certaines personnes, mais très clairement euh, aussi des emplois, donc un problème aussi sociétal dans ce sens-là. Et, et je pense que euh, on, on doit sans aucun doute chercher une solution plus globale, euh, de, de voir dans quelle mesure justement ces emplois peuvent être transformés, aider à être transformés en des emplois euh, plus inclusifs, notamment par rapport à la lutte du climat ou, ou sur d'autres thématiques, parce que malheureusement, euh, je, je crains que de juste déclarer par une belle déclaration « nous ne voulons plus qu'il y ait des achats d'armes euh, », se confrontera très vite à des réalités et, et à des blocages si on n'a pas une vision plus globale et plus complète du problème. Même si évidemment, quant à moi, je trouverais génial qu'on puisse simplement dire n'achetons plus des armes et que on s'arrête, tout s'arrête d'acheter des armes. Mais, mais je crains que ça soit un peu plus compliqué que ça. Merci.
Uh, we've had a couple, thank you, Laurent. We've had a couple of people link uh, the choices, link climate change to, uh, to um, armament centers. And we have had Ivor Fung put in the um, chat the link to finding the reports, which are all public. Um, and I'll read out that um, uh, link uh, shortly. But first, uh, Ambassador Carroza, I wonder if you could answer particularly Alessandro's questions and some of the other questions that have been posed. And you'll have to unmute. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, very much for the questions and, and for the interest. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the big role that parliamentarians, parliamentarians have in voting budgets. But, uh, and budget is where the resources are appropriated for either social or military expenditures. Of course, as Laurent was mentioning, it's a bit more complicated than that, but we sensed at the beginning, and perhaps Ms. Isumi can lead us into the contents of these reallocations that Chile and Korea, Republic of Korea, have made away from uh, military expenditures into uh, social expenditures, which will be a, a great lead, a great example uh, to, to see that it is uh, possible. Um, yes, uh, parliamentarians can dig into budgets and can also not only say, uh, put uh, poli public uh, policies, uh, public electoral policies in the way in which budgets can be allocated to different uh, uh, ends in, in, in uh, their own country. We, we as parliamentarians uh, have a say, a very, very important say. We, we can approve or not approve budgets. Of course, when you go into armaments, that is a very delicate issue, many times a secret, many times undercover for natural, national security reasons, they tell us and so on. But uh, I think that the world has evolved uh, very much, being uh, still the case that, uh, as uh, Alexander was mentioning, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, many years ago, 62 years ago, perhaps, uh, reminded of, of the import uh, of the, not importance, of the weight of the industrial and uh, military company. Uh, yes, uh, as has been mentioned in, in, in the chat, the report is uh, public, is a uh, document uh, circulated by the United Nations, and here is the report for uh, 2021. Uh, out of which uh, we found the 40 countries that have uh, that have uh, filed uh, their reports and the extent into which they have filed, as I said before, one for uh, four lines, some others more nuanced uh, than than that. And uh, finally, I'd like to refer and 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 again, it will be uh, uh, explain us much more on. An occasional paper, number 35, that the Department of Affairs uh, Division uh, published in uh, 2020, in which uh, the, the, uh, what uh, Lohan was mentioning, mentioning is refers, referred to, the conversion of economies. Of course, it's a progressive convention, uh, conversion of economies from the military production to the production of uh, what the paper calls civilian production, goods and services needed for the population. How to, how to turn uh, the activities from one purpose to the other through a progressive uh, process. Uh, and it's uh, very, well, very well set in that uh, occasion of paper 35. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Izumi? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for these uh, questions and comments. I mean, I, I, I want to say in the beginning that I, I very much agree with um, the, the comments made by um, member of the Swiss Parliament. Um, I think, you know, 
Now we're in a situation we need to look at those things more, much more comprehensively um, against the background of other, you know, some of the other major uh, crises and challenges that the, the international community is facing. Um, it's nice to say let's reduce uh, military expenditures, but we need to really nail down to how we might be able to do that. Now, um, as Ivo already shared, it's a public report, MINEX, the, the UN report on military expenditure, it's a public reporting, it's a voluntary uh, mechanism. Countries are invited to, to report uh, on four categories, you know, personnel, operations and maintenance, procurement and construction and research and development. Now, let us, you know, be reminded that this report was, I mean, GA mandate came in 1980 and then the report was developed in 81. This was, of course, at the height of the, the previous Cold War. Um, and, um, and I think at the time there was a global realization that we need to do something about the arms race dynamics. We need to make sure that there will be some sort of a transparency uh, and therefore uh, a beginning of a, a confidence and trust building uh, mechanism and, and therefore um, uh, instituted this uh, um, transparency mechanism called MINEX report. Now at the peak, apparently in 1991, there were 95 countries that reported it. Um, and, uh, but today um, the, that number is uh, uh, really down less than a half. Uh, it's between 30 and 40 countries that are reporting. Um, why? It's probably a combination of, um, you know, um, reporting fatigue, um, decreasing interest, um, and uh, of course, um, you know, uh, people generally speaking are less and less aware of this mechanism um, that exists. And, and perhaps uh, also uh, there is a, a question marks increasingly put uh, as to the, 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 you know, usefulness and, and relevance of this mechanism. So I think we need to, you know, take stock of where we are. We have to think about how to strengthen um, the mechanism and where we might be able to, you know, um, reinforce or, or increase or, or potentially uh, even make new instruments to complement. Um, we have to uh, really seriously start thinking about those issues if we are serious about, um, you know, looking at military expenditures issues. The drive, of course, is a combination of various factors. Um, you know, we heard two things, economic factors, certainly in, you know, major uh, arms exporter uh, countries, it is about um, industry, jobs, employment, economic uh, drives definitely there. Uh, but of course, at the, at the same time, it is the security, you know, perception of uh, a greater threats uh, that is very much behind. Um, and, and so we need to um, look at all of those drivers much more comprehensively uh, and then um, really start to understand that transparency and confidence buildings are instruments to enhance security. Um, that was the original thinking during the Cold War. Um, you know, if we build transparency, um, that would also add to the confidence between states. Now, one of the things that uh, we need to also remember is that MINEX uh, is developed for intrastate um, 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 instruments. So it doesn't adequately address um, the, the issues related to, you know, countries that are involved in, you know, internal conflict and, and why the militarization uh, is there um, in, in those countries. So there are a few issues that we need to, to really think about, and we want to, um, you know, uh, work with uh, partners like um, CIPRI, uh, like IPU, uh, about how we might be able to strengthen the mechanism and therefore strengthen the, the transparency and therefore the confidence building measures, which in our view will increase the security, um, you know, for, for everyone. Thank you so much, Azumi, and thanks for that historical background on the Cold War uh, and transparency. And of course, now there are some issues with transparency in terms of um, uh, climate change, the, the new war that we're all dealing with. Um, and so, uh, and turning to you, Jan, in addition to the questions, I wonder if there's a if there's a divide within many parliaments where the people who are working on climate change or on social uh, development issues 
are not sitting on uh, the, the military or the defense committees and therefore not able to have the impact or to, um, or are often told don't, you know, this is really important, you don't get it. This is, you know, th they're not able to follow the money sometimes, which is why these reportings are so important. But per you will hopefully answer the other questions as well. Well, thank you. Uh, no, to Alexander's question and your question, uh, yes, uh, the economic interests are extremely strong. And by that, jobs, and it goes straight into politics. I was ambassador in Washington. I remember talking to several uh, senators and congressmen who were basically aware of this huge expenditure. But they had a company in their constituency, in their state, and uh, that meant uh, voice uh, votes, that meant jobs. So there is a mechanism here that you even sometimes go against your own convictions on the larger issues. They are aware of the uh, climate issues, but they have to be reelected. So here is a dilemma, and uh, that's why there is an, a need for dialogue and uh, training, education on this issue, and try to come to the conclusion that doing something about this distortion of, uh, of expenditures uh, is seen, this ch a change is seen in the light of enlightened self-interest, because we can't go on like this. Another driver to the, of the uh, expend military expenditures is, of course, the lack of trust, that they are looking at each other as a huge threat. And that's why Izumi is right. We need to have a much, much stronger emphasis on dialogue and and uh, and meetings and discussions and uh, not sort of uh, cutting ourselves off the necessary dialogue. You need to talk to those countries where we have problems and they have to speak to each other. I'm worried now about the trend between U.S., Russia, and China, for instance, uh, and that translates into. Uh, you know, more money to uh, deterrence. If you're afraid, you want to deter. Uh, and it, that is fed by the mistrust. So I think we need to go uh, in a more sensitive direction. Uh, and that leads me to the very wise words from our colleague from uh, Tanzania. Of course, we should focus on the climate crisis. I was uh, as GSG in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I saw how the Mekong Delta is picking is taking in salt water because of the rising of the oceans, and by that the fishing is out and the uh, the cows are dying uh, because the rice fields don't have you know the the right kind of of, uh, of things to eat for them. And and anyway, the, it's here. And I think we need to, uh, we need, my daughter once said to me uh, when I came back from a mediation, uh, don't, you shouldn't come mediate with these evil, these people who just go crazy, go, go fighting. You should mediate peace with nature. <laughs> and I, I, I smiled at that time, but I think it's about time that we find a way to realize that we are interdependent uh, human beings. Uh, animals and, and nature, and uh, we are in a crisis right now, and I could have the, the figures that I mentioned to, uh, to, to extreme poverty, I could translate in the same way to climate, and to say to you that goal number 13 could be achieved practically if we were to take 10 to 20 percent, or at least, well, definitely 20 to 25 percent of that money for, uh, for fighting a climate crisis. So um, you are on the right track. I want to encourage you, and I, I, I think we should uh, we shouldn't be afraid of high ambitions uh, in in this respect. It's not only a question of reporting; it's a question of accepting facts and drawing the right conclusions of facts in the interest of people, in the interest of we the peoples. Thank you. Um, I'm just uh, trying to check if anyone else has any additional questions. Alessandro, did you have something else? You have to I'm unmute. If you now, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, certainly, uh, we, you've shared important information, both the facts, um, the idea of transparency. You've given us some marching orders to uh, go check the reports and um, 
for those country MPs uh, who uh, whose countries have filed reports, perhaps uh, a hearing um, at some of the committees to to dig down into those reports and to see uh, what's there. Um, Azumi, it was interesting, of course, that there's also research information, um, uh, which drives other innovations in countries too. Um, but um, but the choices that have been outlined uh, are very important and members of parliament uh, have to make choices for the long term, uh, as well as the short term of reelectability. Uh, and so it is challenging. And so these reports can, can make a big difference. Um, I, I will turn to each of you for final concluding remarks. If there's some marching orders or some uh, interesting thing you wanted to share. Um, as you were talking, uh, Ambassador Ellison, I was thinking about the, the great quote of no one controls where they're born. It's an accident of birth. And so what are the chances that you're born in a rich country that's spending lots on um, military uh, infrastructure versus those who are in that, those 46 that are so desperately poor and the choices that they may, may wish that others uh, had made um, in those countries. So uh, I will turn to you at first, Ambassador Ellison, and then, we'll, so we'll go in reverse order if there are concluding remarks. Oh, I really don't have much to add. Uh, I think I said what I, I wanted and I think you, uh, have identified the uh, major issues. I think we need to uh, we need to sort of get out of a sense of uh, not hopelessness, but there is a sense of uh, sometimes the problems are so huge mm. that you don't think you can do anything about them. And uh, I, I think that uh, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something, and that we should. Uh, except that we live in a world which is in a troubled state of affairs, but that we, uh, we need to uh, do it together. And there was a threat uh, for a few years from the US side of undervaluing the uh, international cooperation. I think hopefully we are, we are back, but we're never safe. But I think that the main thing is that we realize that in today's world, we can't solve these problems alone. We need to do it together. I, I would go as long as, as far as to say that the most important word in the world is together. together. It's only when we realize the, the strength of that word and that we go that road in, as I said, in our own enlightened self-interest, that's where we can make it. UN and international cooperation is, is not charity. It's a really down-to-earth strategy for survival that we need to adopt now. And that's why we must be uh, stand tall. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and never give up. Terrific. Great uh, words of wisdom. Azumi? Yes, um, of course. Uh, I agree. Everything uh, Jan said. Um, and in addition to that, I think, um, you know, it will be really, really important to have... Um, you know, a bottom-up approach where, you know, really active debates taking place on military spending issues in each and every country and, and society where people actually reflect on, you know, what will be the appropriate amount um, to be spent on, on defense and, and other social and economic sectors. I think, you know, we need to have both the global efforts um, and at the same time, we need to have um, a bottom-up approach where these issues are taken more seriously. Um, and what do we mean by security? Is it, about, is it about military spending or is it a combination of other means for security, such as diplomacy, dialogue, international cooperation, et cetera? And then for that, I think, um, you know, the UN would very much like to um, have a, a strong, um, stronger partnership with um, organizations um, including with interparliamentary union, but also, you know, um, individual uh, parliaments. Um, I mean, what we are talking about really is to re-energize, if you will, uh, the, uh, the famous Article 26 of the UN Charter, least uh, diversion of world's economic uh, resources on armaments. How to reinvigorate that and how to make sure that is actually being implemented. Um, for that, we need to have a, a renewed partnership. Now, for the UN, um, I think we need to do a couple of things. 
Um, number one, I think we need to uh, make serious efforts um, to improve data on military expenditures. Uh, and that obviously we need to do again in partnership, especially with CIPRI. Um, we also need to strengthen uh, research-based advocacy efforts. Uh, Jan is completely right. I think facts have to really uh, drive the policies. Um, and in order to make that happen, we need uh, research-based advocacy. Uh, and then also something, you know, about a better coordination uh, between uh, regional uh, arms control and confidence building measures. Uh, each region, um, different parts of the world have different drives and dynamics related to uh, military expenditure. And we need to also tailor uh, our approaches, um, you know, in, in, in light of all these different dynamics and, and reasons and the drivers of increasing uh, military expenditure. Uh, and of course, um, we want to work with um, you, IPU, uh, and others uh, to promote uh, better oversight of national decision-making processes. Uh, you make budgets, national budgets, and defense budgets, obviously, part of that. Um, so you have a huge uh, role that you can play. Uh, so we want to definitely, um, you know, uh, continue to promote such oversight role, important oversight role of parliaments. Terrific. Thanks so much, Azumi. And I put in the chat cipri.org so that everyone can use their um, uh, access their website, which has important information for when they have that discussion in their parliament or in their committees. Um, and I see that uh, someone has posted another question. Are the threats of terrorism a good justifying factor for increasing uh, in military expenditure? And um, that has come very late, but perhaps uh, Ambassador Carroza, in your concluding remarks, you might uh, have a chance to think about that as well. That's a, that's a, a hard landing. Uh, we <laughs> Sorry. <talk about> the <laughs> and, uh, and the way to cope uh, with that. Uh, global, and, and I'll try to, to refer to it. global uh, defense expenditure, zero. Why not? Why not? Costa Rica took a bold step. Uh, I, I frequently mentioned that was a long time ago. I mean, just imagine, it was the year I was born, Lo a long span of a, of a time. And uh, why be on the defensive if the other people are not on the offensive? I mean, why not talk among each other in order that there will be no need of the terrorists, but rather to join common efforts. Uh, what will history say when they reflect on, on these years, not only the years of the pandemics, but also the years in which uh, inequality and, and uh, exclusion are rampant in uh, the world and expenditures in military are uh, increasing. The world is demanding the nations, the people are demanding a big, big modifications in the social pact, the way in which resources are allocated, not only economic resources, but the, the resources of the world. Let me just uh, praise uh, the wisdom of Jan's daughter. They have the answer. Yes, let's, yeah. uh, let's put the issues in the hands of the youth of the youth, of the young people, as the common agenda uh, launched by the Secretary General purports uh, to do. I mean, to give a central role to the youth. Terrorism, police forces, police forces. How can we, uh, we have increase uh, surveillance, increase uh, intelligence, increase a series of things without the need of equipping and buying bombers. I mean, when I hear the word, the, the word that there are bombers being bought from one country to the other, I just uh, become very, very touchy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your contribution and your passion and, um, and for Costa Rica's fine example. And as a former parliamentarian and uh, an ambassador, you play a unique role. Jan, are you, uh, in yes. addition to wishing us peace, I think you're <laughs> at that no, point. <laughs> no, I wanted just to say that I think we have a, an opportunity to think in new ways now, because 
I, I myself a navy, I myself a navy officer, and I, I follow the, the military debates now. There is a discussion about preparing for the next type of conflict, mm -hmm. and the next type of conflict is not what we have within these one thousand nine hundred eighty-one billion dollars. If we face problems of, of uh, cyber security, of terrorism, of uh, protecting our infrastructure, of having a high preparedness in the civilian defense, uh, protect us as information war. All this requires a new thinking. And maybe now here, IPU and other actors could come in uh, with ideas that have to do with this re reframing of priorities. Because we are now anyway joining a bit debate that will go very quickly in the next four or five years about what are we defending ourselves against. And mm. that gives us a chance to talk about broader security and to see that totality that you are pointing to in this important discussion. Terrific. That's a, a very good reminder, too, to not only acquaint ourselves with the tools that are there and the reasons they are there, but to update and be current with the uh, with the current uh, threats and the future threats and yeah. to put in place the mechanisms that are needed. So what a great way to conclude. Um, and thank you very much for all of you who joined. The, uh, this meeting will be edited uh, or compacted um, uh, and put on our website, ipu.org. Uh, we do uh, have been having these briefings on uh, the idea of my colleague Alessandro Mater um, to make sure that we can provide really informative uh, short sessions for parliamentarians and, and um, that we can uh, make sure that everyone is uh, armed and ready for our <laughs> next um, assembly. Um, it's also on our YouTube channel, as Alessandro um, reminded me. And... Uh, we look forward to all of, seeing all of you in person soon and wish you a very good day and uh, continued safety in all of the senses of that word. So be well, and thank you very much to our three guests for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you very Take much. Care. Adios. Bye. <laughs> Take care. And thanks, Laurence. Um, Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.